So one of the things we want to do early on is to first have these settings running uh, pretty well. So we've got general set so far, and we just looked at admin. Now let's jump over to payments. This on the one hand is very easy screen to look at, and on the other hand needs a little bit more setup. Go over to payments, and what we get here, select the payment gateway. We've got these options, ChronoPay, a few PayPals, and Test Gateway. So at the moment, if this was a real store on the internet and someone tried to buy a product, you would, they would not be able to because you would only see, or they would only see Test Gateway. We can set it up for something called ChronoPay. There's always a middleman. There's a middleman especially when money is involved. And so ChronoPay would be in the middle, because the way this all works is someone comes to your shop, they put their credit card number in, your credit card number then uh, speaks with your, with your bank, and then everyone is happy once the funds are there, and uh, then you get your product. So the, these gateways are in the middle there. We've also got PayPal, PayPal Express, PayPal Payments, PayPal Pro. And remember that oftentimes Pro is the uh, shorthand for not free. So, PayPal Pro, we are not going to, to bother with. We've got either PayPal Express or PayPal Payments Standard. Um, click on Settings of PayPal Standard. And you've got a few things to fill in here. And I'm going to compare PayPal Express settings. You've got other things to fill in here. So either or, or both you can set up, or all three, or all five, or whatever. We can collect payments in a variety of ways. For this class, we're going to use PayPal Standard, <coughs> PayPal Payments Standard. What this is, is simply that um, you plug in your PayPal username here, not a password or anything like that, just your PayPal username here, and then the rest can be defaults. What this is, is that you can go and create a PayPal account for free, not the pro one. You can go to paypal.com, go through the process of creating a, uh, an account there, and I have a video that you can look at on your own, because not everyone can do this right now, wants to do this, maybe they've got their own payment system, there's other ones like authorize.net and so forth. But this, in theory, is very easy because you go over to PayPal, you create the account, and then your username is usually your email address. You just plug your email address and save it, and that's it. You can take credit card payments. They don't need to have, the person doesn't need to have a PayPal account. The person can do debits, account, a debit, credit, debit cards, credit cards, etc. So let's say I had an email address, victor at vbay.com, whatever. And here, behind the scenes, it would just work. So the short answer is, all you need to do is add a, your PayPal username here. The long answer is you need to set up a PayPal account. I have a video that I'll show you for that but we're not going to do that part together. You can do that on your own. You need to go to paypal.com, set up a free account, a business account. Um, they are, it is, it is free to set up, but it will take a commission of all your sales, and that's standard. Anywhere you go, someone is going to take a cut. When it comes to money, someone has to take a cut when it goes from their account to your account and the prices range a lot. Some might be like PayPal 2.9% per sale. So let's say I'm selling an item that costs $329. PayPal is going to take 2.9% of that. PayPal is going to take about $10. $10 off of what you sold. Um, 
that's pretty standard, 2.9%, 2.7%, sometimes you can get it down to 1%. If you're a high volume user, PayPal will work with you and get your percentage lower. You can get the PayPal Pro, which is no commission, but you're going to be paying like, I don't know, $500 a year to have that Pro account. So there's always a middleman to take some cut of it. Yes? PayPal is our merchant, yeah, our merchant, merchant processing system. Um, what they will see, um, they don't see some of the details, but they will see this. When someone is about to buy something, it'll be listed as one of the payment methods, PayPal payment standard. If you don't want it to say that, we can change that. This is the text that people see when making a purchase. I can simply say that to be buy now. It won't mention PayPal and then it'll just say buy now. And behind the scenes, PayPal will take care of the processing and everything. So we want this. We want PayPal to take care of all this. I don't want to store people's credit card information on my account. I don't want to be liable if I get hacked. We're going to let PayPal take care of it all with their advanced security. Question? It's open to see whenever you have the uh, online store, you have the optional payment on credit card. So that means that we would have to set up a portal with the credit card processing company, right? And same as stores also would offer you the optional pay with PayPal or any other uh, way to do it. Um, you are suggesting that we should be starting with PayPal, but what if you already have a credit card processing company with the portal? How do mm. you add that? Notice that that's not one of the options. We have yeah. these different options. To activate some of these other options, this is when some of these like little premium things from the shopping cart come in. <clears throat> Under extensions, products, extensions, there's a whole area here, so you guys don't have to go here yet. But under products and extensions, these are these extra features that will give you more capabilities. Somewhere in here, and I believe it's the gold cart, this one will give you many more payment gateways. Um, $99 one-time fee, but uh, here's these other extra things, you know, working with authorized.net, transfers, USA Pay, etc. So if you already have one of these other payment processors, notice you have to pay a little bit more for that, and that's still in the grand scheme of it not that expensive, especially if you're making money off of your store. But there's always a middleman to deal with this. If we have nothing set up yet of payment processors, PayPal is a great way to get started. And yes, there's also Stripe and Square and, and Authorize.net and all of these ones. And when you go over to WooCommerce, it's the same sort of thing. It'll, out of the box, work with you know, PayPal and such. But if you want to use something else, you have to get these add-ons. This one, in theory, could be working for you right away. The catch is you need to make a PayPal account. The catch is that they're going to take a cut. They all take a cut. I, I know a few you know, entrepreneurs, and they tell me all the time, these credit card processing companies are so extortive. I have to pay for the swiper. You know, Every time you're swiping, someone has to pay for that, most likely a monthly fee of like $200. Um, there's always someone in the middle when it comes to money. So then that's why... Um, you know, sell stuff out of your out of your front door. Then that way you're taking the money directly, the cash. But then right. someone doesn't have cash, so you're still going to take out that square, and that square is going to take two point seven percent. Someone always takes some cut when you're processing credit cards because there's risk. I can go in and swipe my card and buy that five thousand dollar item. Do I have five thousand dollars? Well, I'm going to swipe it and leave before they figure that out. Uh, so there has to be this middleman to deal with the fraud. And so forth. Yeah. I think one of the things that I've, I've heard about PayPal is that when somebody sets it up, you have to check if how they handle things in terms of, let's say, for example, refunds. PayPal has different rules than maybe somebody else has. Mm -hmm. uh, I know in the case of the photography industry, PayPal made some changes that are very mm -hmm. negative to the photography mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's a particular item, especially when it's digital photography. 
you know, once the genie is out of the bottle of some of these digital products, you can't put them back in. I can make a copy of that photo and send it to a hundred people. I can make a copy of that song and distribute it all over the place. So I don't doubt that there are those restrictions for some kinds of products. So I would, I would go over to PayPal.com, read all the documentation, and you know, get as educated as I can, as I can be before making a final decision. These other settings here, I don't really have to deal with them. All the defaults work just fine. Um, so all of this is, you know, just fine. The details and all of that. If you'd like it, if you'd like this to change to say something else, you can change that. You know, by now. Again, the person does not need an actual PayPal account to buy anything. It'll recommend them when they bought something. It'll say, "Would you like to save your information?" Well, PayPal will save it. What you can also do here is write something like pay securely, you know, make it obvious. Pay securely through PayPal. People have heard of PayPal. People, PayPal's been around 20 years, literally. They've been around since the late 90s. They've had 20 years to harden their security and be number one, and they are number one payment processor in this space. And so people heard about it. People probably have an account. If they don't, they don't need it. They can still purchase debit card, credit card. And so I might want to say it this way. Yes. Sorry, I'm asking. <laughs> That's okay. Um, what if what you're selling is not a product? What if you just uh, need to have a token for uh, donations, for example? This is still going to be the same way. Um, you need to have some sort of payment processor, like PayPal, and um, set it up, connect that account with your shop, and you can still take donations. In a moment, when we actually create products, we will see that we can create a special product called a donation. So you're not actually you know, exchanging any goods, it's a donation. And that's when we create a product. <coughs> You can, pipe, you can put whatever you want here or nothing. We don't have a real kind of shopping cart at the moment, so I'm just, you can click update or cancel. It doesn't quite matter. It's not a real site just yet, but I'm showing you here that if you do set this up, you want to select show the PayPal option, maybe remove the test gateway and save it. For our purposes right now, I'm going to keep the test gateway on and the PayPal one. And notice you've got some settings for the test gateway. Right now, when a person visits your website, it'll say manual payment. Because I'm still testing this and it's not real, I'm going to write test gateway. And I'll write warning, no products will be sold. What I could use this test gateway for is to do some sort of manual payments, CODs. No one does those anymore, but if you want to do CODs, you set this up. You could say display name COD, and then you'll have payment instructions. Send your, send your payment within three days to buy your product. Uh, this is pretty rare nowadays. People are going to swipe that credit card or provide those that debit card number, and you bought your product. So I'm just keeping this test gateway here just for testing purposes. We'll update that and save it. So any, any other questions on this screen about payments and such? Um, I, as far as I can lead you is to set this up here, but you need to research on your own. Creating a PayPal account, it's free. Um, it's the recommendation for this shopping cart. It would be the one for WooCommerce also. There's a bunch of other ones. There's a pros and cons for all of them. Some charge you more. Some charge you less. Some are easier to use than others. PayPal is, is good for us. Now let's look at our checkout tab.
use or force user registration. This comes into the topic known as friction. Friction is anything that annoys a user. Friction is anything that impedes a user from completing a task. Your users, your customers, we want to have the least amount of friction between them looking at a product and buying the product. One thing that could cause friction is this here, user force user registration. If I select users must register before checking out, they're going to go to my shop, see a product, click buy now, and then it'll say please create an account. And if your online creation system requires for them to put in a name, an address, an email, and then and then confirm their email, they have to go back to their inbox, click a button to confirm, and all that. I've lost interest. I went off to Amazon and bought my product where I'm already registered. Friction. Anything that annoys the user or prevents them from completing a task. So, you have to decide this. Would you want people to first create an account? And what will happen is it will set up this registration system where now you will again be collecting more data on people. If you don't want to deal with that, you can turn off, you don't have to register. So the option is a person doesn't have to register to buy a product, but every time they come back, they'll have to fill in their details again. That's a form of friction too. You can't win. Some people don't want to create an account and just want to buy anonymously. Some people do want to create the account and buy with a whole username. You don't know which of yours is more apt to do that, which of your customers is more apt to do that. So you have to decide which of these you want. And I keep saying about you're going to save this information, you need security. And I mentioned this previously, I'll mention it again. SSL certificate. That is, when I talk about security, the security is that little lock on your site. The HTTPS on your site. At the moment, you're going to get a non-secure website. You go to Bluehost, GoDaddy, HostMonster, Cox, Yahoo, whatever. They're going to sell you a website space and they're <coughs> going to sell you the non-secure version. And more and more of us care about our security online. A lot of scary stuff happens with people getting hacked, credit cards being stolen, sites being broken into. Well, if you're, if you're visiting websites that don't have HTTPS and the lock, your information is traveling through the internet naked. Everything that you're sending is insecure. Credit card information, private messages. If you don't see that lock, HTTPS, your information is naked. And so, at the moment, your site is like that. It's insecure. It doesn't matter for us as a testing site, but once you go off to a real site, which we'll get into those details later, you do want security. And security is not free. I just did a quick search here. Digicert.com will sell it to you. Rapid SSL, SSLs.com, $4.99 a year, which is one of the most affordable ones I've seen, and I'm very shocked about that because usually I'm seeing that at about $90 a year. This is probably $4 for the first year. Question? So if you have an unsecured site, you use PayPal, you pay to PayPal, they're obviously secure, right? Yes. Especially if you go to them security. Exactly. But, but you're saying if you collect people's information and you don't have a secure site that their information could be at risk that you're yes. your site. Exactly. The credit card part of all of this, that's going to be secure because PayPal is going to take care of it. PayPal will step in, activate their security, and their credit card data will be safe. But not anything else. Not if this person has their home address and all of that that we choose to save on our server. So how would SSL actually work when somebody Honestly, the exact details about how it works, I'm not exactly sure. We don't quite need to know exactly how it works. It's just that we set it up with whatever one of these many, many providers to choose from. And then when someone visits your site, it will automatically then have security features enabled. How it actually works and such, I'm not exactly sure. But there is, I'm, I guess they do get in the middle, compress the data, uh, encrypt the data, and then the data moves across the internet securely instead of plain text. 
GoDaddy sells this, Bluehost sells this, a lot of companies sell this. And again, I just did a quick search here, lots of prices. What is it? How to set it up? Uh, obviously, you're liable for credit card information, so you don't want to hold that. But if you do have personal information that gets compromised, uh, are you required by law to notify those people that, that their name, address, or something has been made has been compromised? Not for the smaller companies, really, but as this becomes more on the forefront, I don't doubt that there will be more legislation and <laughs> such about it. This is required for like big companies and especially governmental entities. They are required to be transparent and disclose all of this. It's just good business practice at the moment that if you are compromised to let your customers know about it, to deal with it. So I don't believe in the US there are laws that compel us to do that, but it's good customer service to show that something went wrong, we're going to fix it, trust us, we, we made a mistake, but we'll fix it. So again, that's a big can of worms, but what helps you deal with that is to have SSL set up. Um, even, unfortunately, sometimes that's not enough, uh, because there's, a, there's this concept known as social engineering. Has anyone heard of that? Social engineering. Social en engineering is a tactic that hackers can use to break into something without breaking a password. This is by breaking a person. For example, I can call, you know, the 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 your I can call the customer support number of your company and sweet talk the person that answered and act like I can't log into my site. Please help me here. And they're gonna say, okay, what's your social security number? What's this? What's that? And then using these you know, techniques of a, of a basically, you know, a sweet talk or a shyster. I'm going to convince the person, I'm the real person, let me into my account. Those kind of hacks are also on the rise. There's no way to protect against that because it's a person on the other side of the phone getting hacked. That happens all the time. It was just revealed, I think, on Snapchat. You know, billion dollar company Snapchat got hacked because someone sweet talked someone on the phone to let them in. You don't. You wouldn't believe it that if someone calls in and says, "I'm the CEO and I need those numbers right now, Johnson. Give me those numbers. Let me log in. I don't remember my password." They're so scared of the boss, they let them in, and now they got their they got their database hacked. So, it's it's a huge issue now of security. Um, yes. Getting back to the SSL certificate, other than getting the reviews and um, the stars, um, do you have a company that you recommend getting an SSL certificate? I would get it with the same one that you get your provider set up for your website. So if I go to HostMonster, they're going to sell you SSL there too, just because that's then easier to deal with one company than multiple companies. And they provide that nowadays also, and they have the incentive. You go over to GoDaddy, I want a year of service, they're going to give you an SSL for the first year. After that, it goes back to regular price of $70 or $80 a year or whatever. So personally, I've worked with GoDaddy and I've worked with Bluehost and HostMonster. All of them, in my experience, have been good. Uh, and again, we'll have another day where we talk more in detail about this. But go with the provider that you're already using for your main site. So I'm not going to be requiring people to register personal info, so I'll keep it there. Uh, and notice. Coupled with that, we've got security encryption. Allow site to be used insecurely. That sounds scary. Let me turn on security. But I have to pay for that. So you know, I can't turn on that security until I go with the provider to pay for it and set it up. And then I can turn this on. And then now when people log on to my site, it'll say HTTPS, Victor's Bakery. And then it'll be much more secure. For the moment, keep it on insecure because we, we can't set security. We need to pay for it. Part of user friction, and I'm really surprised about this one. It's it's currently set not good. I want shipping same as billing to select the first option. You visit plenty of e-commerce sites, and it often asks you for a billing address and a shipping address. And usually, they're both the same. I'm from my house. I'm going to get billed, and from my house, I want it to get shipped. But sometimes, I'm using my personal credit card. So my billing address is my home, but I want this shipped to the office. So I need a different 
shipping address. I would type two different things. For some reason, WP Commerce has this set users must re-enter shipping because you usually fill in billing address and it also has shipping and you just click a button that says the same and it takes what you wrote in billing and puts it also into shipping. For some reason, that is off on WP Commerce and a person will have to retype their whole address again. That's annoying. That's friction. That's one more step that a person gives up and goes elsewhere. I highly recommend to activate this first box. When they fill in billing, they click the button and it will automatically populate shipping. Less friction. Then we've got a section here. This is the information you're going to be collecting. And, uh, and some of you might not need all of this stuff. So it's going to ask for a billing information, a bunch of shipping information. It'll ask for first name, last name, address, all of this stuff, email. You can rearrange the order that these things are asked by simply dragging and dropping from this little dripper right here. You've got these columns then. Display and mandatory. Um, and then plus and minus. I can add more fields. We'll see that in a moment. But let's say, actually, I don't want to ask for the difference first name and last name. I don't want to ask for last name, so I'll, I will <coughs> take off display last name, and I will change this box, and it will ask them simply name or full name whatever full name they're going to type there in one field will be captured instead of first name, last name in two fields. It'll ask for address and city and state and country, email. I don't want their email so I can turn it off. Notice we've got mandatory. You do have to fill in the full name, etc. It's saying you don't have to fill in the state, which is kind of odd. I would put that mandatory. I need to know your state. Post, you know, the postal code, the zip code. Uh, actually, I'll change that to zip code. You don't hear postal code that much. You hear zip code. Zip code, I want that mandatory. Phone number. Um, that can be filled in optional, so I'll leave it non-mandatory. So uh, this is the information I'm asking for, and I also want a person to put in their let's say for whatever reason, their Twitter address. I want to know what their Twitter address is so that maybe we can follow them on Twitter. So to add a brand new field, I'll say I'll add it after email. At the end here, you've got plus and minus. Click plus on email to add a new field below it. And I will ask here, Twitter address. It's going to be text that I'm accepting there, one line of text. I can select text area, and that'll create a big box for someone to write something. Heading, I can divide my information that I'm asking for into different sections with headings. I can do select, so they can select from a bunch of options. I can do radio button, which is like select, but they will be you know, little circles to fill in, check boxes, and so forth. So I can capture whatever amount of information that I want. I'll be saving it to my database on my server. I can make it required or not. I won't make that one required. I could. If in the future I don't actually want to ask for that anymore, I can delete it with minus, or I can just say hide it. I don't want to remove it. The first part of the, at the very end of the line where you see email at the very end, you'll see a plus to add a new item. Within this section, it asks the person, your billing contact details. Uh, I'll call that billing info. Billing info, and then it'll ask shipping info. And because we activated the option up there, a person can just click a button and that stuff will go from the top down here to shipping. Um, I have to change this form a little bit too. I'm not asking for last name anymore, so 
don't show that one anymore. I'm asking for full name, address, city, state, postal. I'll put that back on zip. <coughs> so here I've got this uh, checkout form. People will see this. They need to fill it in to fully buy the product. I can have more than one checkout form. Select the form set. This is my default one. I don't have any others. But I can create multiple checkout forms for different situations. Certain products will show certain checkout fields. Maybe at a certain part of the year I have a certain sort of sale and I'm capturing certain information. So I can add some new ones. I'm just going to use this default one, but you can add more forms as necessary later. At the bottom, click Save. This is our checkout. Any questions on this screen? Yeah, in the where you put it in underneath the email, and I put text. I wasn't able to type into that box. You're not going to type into this text box. You should be able to type into the empty box on the left. Let's now jump over to Marketing tab. Now, WP Commerce, this plugin, has a simple but effective version of this, whereas WooCommerce has a more complex one, maybe too complex for some people. Uh, we have the concept of, of upselling and cross-selling. Have you ever bought a product, and after you bought the product, it might say, people that bought that product also bought this product. That's cross-selling. I bought one thing, and an, another thing maybe in the same economic category, horizontally, could be something that I might want to buy. I bought this item for my cat. It's people that bought this might also buy this for their cat. Cross-selling. It's the same sort of uh, concept. Um, we've got upselling. That's when I'm about to buy a product, you know, a $10 item for my cat. And it says, well, if you pay $15, you get a better version of it. That's upselling. This doesn't have upselling. It only has cross-selling. Users who bought this also bought. So it'll recommend to people, you bought this, why not also buy this, based on customer experience. If you want the more complex ones, that's WooCommerce. It can be pretty complex, such as setting, if someone bought this, and it also recommends that they buy that. Or someone is about to buy this, and it'll say, maybe buy this other one, based on rules, and such, an algorithm. For us, don't quite need it, and this is pretty effective as is here because then it'll convince people perhaps to buy a little bit more. We have a share this button and that's also very useful. Someone bought something they might want to share with their friends and family that they got such a great deal they can then share it on Twitter or on email or whatever. Now the thing though is I don't recommend to use this sharing feature or this Facebook like feature because when we talk about it a little bit later we will talk about a better plugin. The built-in one here is okay but the one we'll talk about later which is in the syllabus it's called Jetpack we'll get to it later. Jetpack has a lot of great features and one of them is this sharing. You do want sharing for the moment we won't use these two built-in ones we'll get back to it later with Jetpack. How customers found a survey. Add the how did you find out about us drop down option at checkout. Not a lot of customization, but when they're about to check out, they can select from a few options uh, word of mouth, website, radio, whatever. And that is a little bit useful to figure out what have I, ha have my efforts been affected? Let's say I did spend time by promoting my business on the radio, and more people are clicking that button there to see that. 
to check that they heard us on the radio. That can tell me, I did a good job on the radio. Or let's say I spent this money on the radio and I'm not getting anyone selecting radio. That means maybe I didn't create a very good ad or it's not reaching the right audience. It is optional, but I like to turn it on because you never know what data might come from it. And the more data you get, the better to make good decisions. Don't worry about product RSS. Don't worry about Google Merchant. We've got Google Analytics tracking. Uh, we can't really get too much into this. Uh, this is for some of my other classes, the, the SEO class. We talk about Google Analytics, which basically lets you track so many details about a person's visit on your site. If we set up Google Analytics, we will be able to track how long did someone spend on your site, what pages they visited, what was the order of the pages they visited. All of this data for us to make good decisions. We can't really set this up right now because we would need our unique Google tracking ID. Again, we don't talk about that in this class. Take the SEO class and we, and we set that up. So this is something that I would set up. We can't really talk about it here because we, we don't have really the time to get into detail. Take the SEO class. How many of you have heard of Google Analytics before this class? A few people. Okay. If you've heard of it, you want to set it up here. If you haven't heard of it, take the SEO class and we'll, we'll get into details about it. Um, I made a couple of changes here, so remember to save. Any questions on this screen? All right, let's go over to the import screen. This is the screen that is that attempts to let you bring in your products from a different system into this system. And uh, WooCommerce would have the same, and Shopify would have the same. They all have a way to bring the products and your data from some other shopping cart to this shopping cart. And as I've said, I've done this for clients, my company's done this for clients, and honestly it's always been hard because every shopping cart solution believes they're the best ones. But here, <coughs> what we get is a peek behind the scenes that, again, this is all running on a database. We create that database at the beginning of the day in phpMyAdmin because the database holds everything about your site, including products. A database is just a collection of information. In a sense, this is a database. When you guys sign in here, this is a database. It's got your name, the time you got here and you left, and other information. This is a database, you know, a real-world database. A digital world database has the, the list of products and price and poundage and um, availability and all of that stuff. So the database here is set up a certain way because this these plugin authors said this is the best way. So they developed their database system and then WooCommerce they say no this is the best way and then Shopify says no this is the best way. So a lot of the times they're not really exactly one-to-one -one compatible. When a product is saved, when we get to creating products, it's going to get, it's going to ask for a product name, description of the product, additional description, a price, a stock keeping unit, we'll talk about all of this weight, etc. It keeps track of all of that stuff for your products. And for some of my products, I don't need a weight. An MP3 doesn't weigh anything. So I'm not going to use that field. But in the database, these are the fields that make up a product. There's an example down at the bottom. Banana, the yellow fruit, contains potassium. 0 0.67 cents. Banana, 150 uh, grams. And then the zero, what's the zero? This is in the order. This is the order that these are at. There's another one. Apple, red. Description, red, round, juicy, isn't an orange. Another description, and then price, 25 cents. And then a skew, red delicious, 5 ounces, 10 in stock. We don't really need to deal with this. It's behind the scenes. 
We only need to deal with this if we're taking our inventory out of some other system and putting it into this system, WP Commerce. WooCommerce would have the same sort of thing. Let's say we were eventually want to move out of um, WP Commerce and bring it into WooCommerce. WooCommerce would have something like this also. The point of this is that the, WooCom the WP Commerce database is set up in this order. If I tried to feed it, it says here, upload your database. If I tried to feed it a database that was set in the order of product name, product price, description, it's going to put the product price into description and not into the proper field of the price. In WP Commerce, the price needs to go into the fourth, the fourth column of data. And maybe WooCommerce puts it in the second column of data. So when we've had to do this for clients, we downloaded the database from the other system, opened it up in Excel, and had to rearrange everything to fit the right columns that this system would need or the other system would need. And you might think it's easy, but, you know, it took us a few days, a couple of us working on this. You know, you start on the first 100 and I'll do the next 100. And making it all line up in the proper columns, when it was all set up, then we uploaded it, and then there were still some little quirks here and there that we had to fix manually. <coughs> so each solution thinks it's the best one. And you won't know really which is the best one until you get into this, unfortunately. This one will work really well for most people. This is the one we use. I don't think I've mentioned it in this class, but last class. Remember that Mexican food restaurant? It uses this one, the completely free WP Commerce. Their whole system of selling a variety of Mexican food items with combos and all of that complexity is in this. So which one do you need? WooCommerce, WP Commerce, Shopify? I can't exactly tell you. Hopefully you're going to explore both in WAMP, figure out which is the best one for your purposes, make mistakes, and then eventually figure out, okay, WooCommerce will work, Shopify will work, something else will work. So basically on this one, when it says the CSV file, it's telling by one and two it's saying either of these formats are going to work. Basically without the quotation parameters, uh, strings, and width, right? Because the first one that, like the yellow fruit, you know, that's that true. It doesn't care, but as long as you, you do fill in all the fields, because notice right. there's a couple of quotation marks at the end right here, which is an empty field, but it right. still requires a value. So in this case, quantity, when you put a quantity of zero, that means unlimited quantities. There's unlimited bananas. But here there's only 10 apples. So if we say that we have a quantity, 10, it's true that we have a limited amount. When we have zero up here, we're saying we, we have unlimited amount of bananas, so we don't have to specify we have a limited amount. But we still have to feed it an empty field, or else, you know, if I have this database, I've got these fields, these columns, and if I try to fill in data but not say a time in, it's incorrect data. So this is pretty advanced at this point here, so this is the point of figuring out, should I start from scratch, or should I try to import my old database? And this might be one of the, part, the times when I go up to the help at the top right and read the documentation. And if it still is not quite as helpful, I get premium help. I pay the developers of this plugin to help me with this. I don't know the price. You can look into it. But this is the complexity of running a store. And yes, then other stores come along. Squarespace has a powerful uh, e-commerce feature and Wix and all of these. Everyone wants to do e-commerce now. Everyone thinks they've got the best solution. The best solution is the one that works for you. So any solution will work if it works for you. Uh, whichever one you learn and does what you need it to, whichever one is as easy as you want it to be, which one has the features you need it, the right e-commerce solution is the one that works for you. I can give opinions, and I've worked with both WooCommerce and WP Commerce, but each particular, and also Business Catalyst, but each particular one needed a certain set of features. Doing the research, 
reading the documentation, asking the developers, gave us the answers to make the decision to set up the right e-commerce solution for the right client. Price is also a big thing. You go off to some of these all-in-one places, and they do it all in one, but it's much more expensive. And it might not be a problem. If you get the product that you want and you're selling enough to recoup your investment into the system, then that's fine. I know someone that has a shop that he says, you know, um, I'm used to paying $200 a month for my e-commerce system to work on top of the $300 that I'm paying for everything else a month. But for some of us that are in more of a budget, this could work just fine. As far as the database goes, we enter an amount that we have available there. Does it deduct automatically whenever it's sold or not? Whenever it's, it's whenever it's what? It's being sold. Let's say you have ten apples. If someone buys one. Yeah. Yeah, it will deduct automatically. Exactly. We'll see that when we create the products, we can set a number in inventory. And it will decrease when someone sells it. It'll decrease when someone adds it to the cart. Because remember, if someone adds it to the cart, but they don't buy it until tomorrow, they've still reserved it. And uh, we can set it so that when it runs out, I'll get an email to tell me that product is out. So we can do all of that. Let's look now then. Uh, any other questions on import? Not, mu not many of us will need to work with this. Honestly, I kind of feel start from scratch it's going to be a little bit easier to work than start trying to shoehorn in something from another system that may be a lot of work to start all over too so i don't have a good answer for everyone it's going to depend on your system if you're going to start over or try to import it from another platform let's go to presentation bunch of little things to look at here but i'll point out the things that i would really recommend Add, you can make people add stuff to the cart, add this, add that, and then eventually check out. Or you can add directly, buy now. That's up to you. Hide add cart to button? No, I do want people to see a button to add this to the cart. Why would you ever turn it off? For advanced features in PHP where you make people do this and that before add to cart, this is pretty advanced, so just leave that. No, yes, I do want to add. have people add to cart. Show product ratings, that's up to you. Do you want people to give a rating to your product? Yes or no? Stock availability, do you want to show people you've got seven of these left? It's up to you. Display fancy purchase, I would say on this one, yes. Right now what happens when someone adds an item to their cart, you don't get very good feedback. Unfortunately, people are going to say, did something happen? And they'll click add again and again. And then suddenly they'll end up with three of those items in the cart. If you turn on display fancy purchase notification, <laughs> you'll get a nice little pop-up that says add it to cart, keep shopping, or check out. So I'm not sure why that one's not on by default. That's a very good one. Turn on display fancy purchase notification. You're going to see we skipped taxes and shipping for the moment, but we've got the ability to tax everything at once or individual items. And right here we're saying display shipping or taxes on an individual case-by-case -case basis, yes or no. It's up to you. Doesn't really matter. Yes works fine. Disable link and title depends on the theme. What will happen is you will see a list of all products, the title of the product, and if they would like to read more about the product, they can click on the title. Then they can read various paragraphs about the product. If you don't want people to be able to click the link to read more about the product, you turn on yes. Do not let them read more. It's off by default, which is usually what you want. But depending on your theme, you may or may not want that. Add quantity field. I'm going to sell apples. Actually, better yet, I'm going to sell apple pies. Victor's Bakery. Would you like to be able to buy more than one pie? Yes. And then they will see a little box there to add three pies. 
if you're only selling one item at a time, you know, you've got one-off items that you make yourself by hand, and you've only got one of them. I don't want people to buy two of them. They don't exist. So depending on your products, yes or no. I'm going to say yes. I can sell more than one pie. More than one of that pie. Product page settings, product display, and grid view. These are, these are related to each other, but... Um, the product view, the grid view settings doesn't work until you activate product display grid, but I can't select product dis display grid because that's part of the extra, the gold cart, the $99 extra features where you can take more credit cards, have more design choices, have more features of the, compared to the free one. So I'm going to leave this for default view. But if I wanted a list view of products, a grid, you know, graphics, a grid of products, I have to pay for that. So all of these other grid, grid view settings don't even select anything because we can't select the grid view. Show list of categories, don't worry about that. What product category, don't worry about that. I'll explain that a little better. Sort products. Put them in the order that they were last uploaded or alphabetical, or order of price, or drag and drop. I might want to make one product above another product. Whatever you want here, but I'm going to go with name, ascending, alphabetical, from A to Z. If I want them backwards, from Z to A, or from you know 9 to 1, descending. Breadcrumbs, don't worry about that. Product groups. Uh, don't worry about that. Some of these, some of these are not that useful, so that's why we're skipping them. And some of them are better set up other ways, which I'll get to. Yes. Yeah. Is there a way to let the customer decide how they want their products sorted? At the moment, no. You have to set it up yourself. Um, they do have the ability to search, so they can search for products and get them displayed that way, but not not to filter at the moment. Uh, display featured, replace title. Okay, uh, don't worry about subcategory. Don't worry about category name. Display featured products above. This one uh, might not make sense at the moment, but it's it works like this. I can have three cakes that I'm selling, and I will mark one as featured. One cake that starts with an A, one that starts with a B, one that starts with a C. I have it alphabetical. So my C cake will be the third cake displayed. But if I mark it as featured and I say yes here, it'll take the C cake and put it above the A and the B cake. It'll give preference to any products that are marked as featured and put them above any other organization. Sometimes I want that. I want to sell up. I want to sell out of a particular product. I'll mark it as featured, and it'll take precedence over the rest. So this is up to you which one to decide on. But I think it's kind of useful to put yes. But the trick is you have to make sure you set your products as featured, and we'll see how to do that later. Where are you going to display the cart? Uh, it, it, uh, that will all exist. When someone adds stuff to their cart, they will always have the option to, to go to, uh, to check out, and it'll have a list of all of their products in the, in the shopping cart. But another way to deal with it is right here. Uh, in a widget. Remember we can put side items in the widget sidebar and all of that. So the default here is fine. We got manual which is pretty advanced, don't worry about that. And we've got something called Drop Shop, which is a, a another way to manage shopping carts. It's not free. Uh, it's not active. I have to activate it. So I'll just leave that one alone. Would you like to display for people it's their product and it and it'll say plus postage and tax. 
uh, do you want people to know that whatever it costs, then you also have to add postage to it? Uh, a lot of times people assume that already. Everything gets taxed. Everything gets has shipping. So if you want to to be very overt about that, you can put yes. It'll say it costs this plus postage and tax. That's optional. I'll leave it off. Most people now know that after you know 20 years of the web. Yeah, I'm going to get tax for stuff. Show product category description. Don't worry. Show product thumbnail. Don't worry. Product count per product category. Okay, so these ones about category settings. Don't worry about that yet. Thumbnails. So I've got some sizes here to display my product thumbnails. They're all square at the moment, and they relate to where it says crop thumbnails. It says no. And we've got yes means that thumbnails are cropped to exact dimensions. Normally they are proportional. So if my, these are all square thumbnails. If I upload product pictures that are horizontal, if my products are all horizontal, I'm going to force them into a square shape. And therefore they might look distorted. Because I've got crop thumbnails? No. If I put yes, it won't, it won't distort them in, to fit into that shape. It'll cut them off. It'll cut off the edges. So both of these solutions perhaps are not so good. If you've got rectangular images, they're going to be dealt with not very well. One way to deal with it is instead put dimensions here of the proportion of your pictures. My pictures are going to be rectangular. So what if I put my default products instead to be 200 by 100? This will still shrink them down, but then now they'll be in the proportion of a rectangle instead of a square. And I can do this where I've got single product image. If a person clicks to read more about a product, it can show the picture larger. 300 by 200, for example. This requires that I've got a little bit of planning and design set up in that all my product photos are going to be rectangles instead of squares. I don't know that yet, perhaps, so maybe I don't know what to put here. But these are some values, and these also depend on the theme that you have. So I'll set this for the moment. I might need to set it again later, but this is going to either cut your pictures or shrink your pictures to fit into, into the right spot. It might be moot. You might not even want to show thumbnails. You can turn them off. I don't recommend that one. People want to know what they're about to buy. Use light box effect. Light, light box effect. This is another good one. Leave that one on. This is going to show at biggest, a 300 by 200 pixel sized picture. But let's say you uploaded 500 by 400 size for to show more detail. If you leave this light box effect turned on, it will let people click and zoom in to see a larger version of the graphic. If you don't want that zoom in effect, you can turn it off. I would recommend leave it on and also under here choose color box. That's the nicer looking version of zoom in. Thick box will just zoom in, it looks okay, not that interesting. Color box is nicer. It zooms in, it shows you, you know, the zoom in arrows and all of that. It's a little nicer. Your own theme might have a built-in light box. So Here's another one where I might say it depends on your theme. Choose these options and then change them as you like. Pagination. At the moment when we add products, all of our products will be shown on one page. All of them. So if we've got 20 products, it will be a long list of 20 products. I want to display instead maybe five products. Next page. 
five more products. Next page. That's pagination. You say yes, I want to display five products at a time. This is optional, whatever you want here. I'm going to turn it on just to see how it works. And then when it says next page, previous page, do I want that to be displayed only at the bottom? No, I'd rather have it at both, top and bottom. Because sometimes I know I saw that product on page 3, and now I've got to scroll all the way to the bottom of page 1 and the bottom of page 2 to go to page 3. If I say both, I will be able to quickly go to page 2 or 3 from the top of the screen or the bottom of the screen. In comments here, don't worry about this. This is an extra system that you need to set up where people can comment on your products. But WordPress has built in the ability to, for people to add basic comments. So I wouldn't worry about that. We'll use the built-in one. Click Save Changes. Whatever I skipped, I'll address it in different ways better. Are there any questions on anything we saw here? Again. It's just the way that it will present your zoomed in version of your picture. When it shows it as a small thumbnail and you click it, then it will zoom it in larger. Color box or Does thick box. In the same screen, but it might show it rather plain with thick box and it shows it a little nicer with color box. You can't quite visualize it yet until we add products, but color box is nicer. The last thing here, then we'll take one more break, uh, advanced theme settings. These are all of the pieces that make up our shopping cart. There's a file that displays what does it look like when someone is going to download their mp3. What is it going to look like when, uh, when someone is looking at an individual, at the whole products page? We can edit all of that. Remember, we've got appearance editor. But at the moment, those items are not in the editor. If I wanted to pull back the curtain and edit the code, if I go to editor, the nuts and bolts of WP e-commerce are not there. So what if you'd like to edit that, what it says is you need to select these items and move them over to the main editing area. We might play with that a little bit. Let's say I do want to edit, you know, the um, transaction results. I want that to look a little different. Click on that and select move template file. And later, when we go over to Appearance Editor, now we will be able to edit that a little more deeply. You can select them all, that'll be fine. And that's related here too. If you want to... If you want to make a backup of your theme. Duplicator is still better than this backup, so I don't really use that. And then sometimes you log into your site through the file manager and then that's not synchronized with what you're doing here in the dashboard. So if they're unsynchronized you can flush that. Usually no one's gonna do that. You're gonna edit your site in dashboard so you don't have to worry about that. But the reason we would select any of these pages of the shopping cart would be to be able to edit them manually. Any questions on, uh, on this screen? Let's take our last break and when we come back we'll look at a couple more of these settings and then uh, we'll, be at, we'll be at the end of the day. So it's 3.03, we'll be back at 3.13.